Revelation chapter number one. I want to ask you tonight, church. Uh, first off, for starters, I want you to ask you who believes the Bible. Amen. amen. So we've established the fact that a lot of you said amen, you believe the Bible, right? So you believe the things the Bible says. So we believe in 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse 16, the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Do we believe that? We believe that we should be studying. We believe that we should study the Bible, correct? All right, how about we believe that we should be coming to church? The Bible tells us Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. And I'm fully aware this is a Sunday night crowd. I get that. I understand that. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. So we, we, we've established the fact that we believe we should, uh, that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. We've established the fact that if that's true, that we should be in church. And we also need to establish the fact that the Bible tells us where to study. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. We believe that. So we believe those things. So if we believe all those things, we believe the Bible, then we also have to believe this fact. We're getting close to the Lord coming back. We are getting closer and closer every day to the Lord coming back. I heard something today and yesterday about the old thing that our, our, our fellow over in the White House decreed today that this has been going on now for 10 years. But he made it a point to point it out this year. Why? Because it's on Easter Sunday, I guess, for whatever reason. But regardless of that, we have to know the fact that we are closing in on the, on the day that the Lord's coming back. That means if you are here and you are saved, you're going to stand before God and have to give an account for what you've done. So if that's the case, I want to ask you a question tonight. This has to do with, I've prayed about preaching some parts of this for a while now, but after the message on Wednesday night, I'm thankful for what the pastor uh, preached and what God laid in his heart Wednesday night because it helped settle me with what we're going to preach tonight. Your excuses for fleeing. Let me ask you this, church. Are you really going to stand before God and say, I couldn't go to church because I didn't feel good? Now, I don't know how much of the nail prints we'll see, you know, Brother Adrian or what all, but you're really going to stand before him and tell him, well, you know, I couldn't go to church during revival because I just wasn't feeling up to it that week. Really? I'm not talking about sick. If you're sick, stay home. But we know the difference between sick and I really didn't feel good. Are you really going to stand before God and tell him you needed that money for that extra overtime you volunteered for, and that's why you couldn't come to church? Wow. That's why you couldn't go out on visitation. That's why you couldn't do whatever it may be. That you just needed that money more than you needed church. Wow. Really going to do that? Are you really going to be willing to stand before God and claim something else was more important? We talked about this. We got a chance to play golf Friday. I love to play golf. I haven't played near as much as I used to, but I enjoyed it immensely. I love being outside, just being in nature. I love it even more. You play with somebody you enjoy it with. Never once has it crossed, and I'm not perfect by no stretch, but never once has it crossed my mind that I'm going to skip church on Sunday to go play golf. But how many times do we skip because it's more important to go to the lake or it's more important to go hunt or more important to go fish or more important to go yard, whatever it may be? Are we really going to be willing to stand before God and claim that that is our excuse? Are we really going to be stand before God and say, it just wasn't in my personality, Brother Ron, to worship like that? I know it was going good at church, and, and I know you spoke to my heart, and you told me to stand up and shout, but it just, that wasn't like me, so therefore I just, I decided to step back. Can I say, standing before God, my, I, I believe, when we're going to think we're going to offer up excuses, it's going to go more like this. That was only 15 seconds of an awkward silence. You think you're going to stand before God and come up with all the excuses that you come up with today? Daniel chapter number 10 and verses 5 through 9. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen whose loins were girded with fine gold of upaz. His body also was like barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire. And his arms and his feet were like in the color of polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this by great vision. There remained no strength in me. 
For my comeliness was turned into corruption, and I retained no strength, yet I heard the voice of his words. And when I heard the voice of his words, there was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And the last verse, our pastor read it this morning, Revelation chapter number 1. What happened to John when he seen the Lord? And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. We're not going into eternity and offering up whatever excuses that we think we can come up with now. So whatever you think, whatever excuse you have, we, you know, we've talked about this. Uh, brother, our pastor mentioned it. We have no idea the revival coming up. Even just the weeks of, of service coming up, of which one's going to be our last one? It's not a matter of the Lord coming back. We, God could take us out of here tomorrow. They're talking about severe weather around here the next few days. We don't know what's going to happen. We better watch what excuses we're using because you're not going to use them before God. They're not going to mount anything when you stand before him. What excuses are you using to flee before God tonight? We're going to be reading one verse in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, and today changed my mind because I'm concerned about people. Uh, chapter 1 Timothy 4 verse 2 says, Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That word conscience, it means your understanding or you're able to be aware of things. And, you know, there's dangers to having your conscience seared. Today is a danger. As much of a blessing it is to have people to come, it's also a danger. Because that danger is we have in this world what I call people that are CEO. Christ, uh, Christmas, Easter only. And that's what we have today is people that come. And the danger of that is that your heart becomes hardened to the things of God. You, you'll get hard on God and every time they come, it's easier and easier and easier for them to walk out those doors and despise this place, despise your preacher, despise what's going on here. Why? Because their conscience, their understanding, their awareness of this becomes so less value to them it's, it becomes hardened but you know in these verses it's not only that they become hardened but they heed false teaching right. you know what happens to people they say look at him so this guy here is he's just nuts you know saying you ought to be faithful just like brother Josh you ought to be faithful to church you ought to not have to beg people to come to church right. but they say well you know what it's whatever we'll do whatever we want to do and we'll go our own way you believe what you want to believe I'll make it my way that's a false teaching right. there's only God don't put people in hell because they don't come to church he puts people in hell because they're not saved right. everybody goes to hell for being lost they don't go to hell because they're drunks they don't go to hell because they're whoremongers they go to hell because they're lost because they heed false teaching then they become hypocritical in what they believe you know there's so many ideologies of what the world says what the world promotes you know uh, they here's what they say you know what I've heard preachers say this you can't you have to wear these types of glasses you can't wear the chrome ones that's that's hypocrisy right it's a sin to wear gym shoes. That's hypocrisy. Huh? It's, it's a sin to wear pants with zippers on them. That's hypocrisy. Why? That's not in the book. They heed those. They become hip, hypocrites in what they believe. And the church is full of hypocrites. It's, not, it's a good for me, but it's not good for you. Last of all, I'll say this. Their hope is in their works. Every false, I don't care if you're a Catholic, I don't care if you're Amish, I don't care if you're a Hindu, I don't care if you're a Buddha, I don't care. Every one of them have the same thing in common. They're trusting in what they're doing to get to heaven into the future. I want to say this, there's only one way to get to heaven, and that's by the grace of God, that's trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ. Friend, I want to tell you, we are in a world that today I was thinking, God, this place was full, but my heart was sad because they heard a preacher preach preach and it did not mean nothing to them and they went out the door as lost as it was when they got here and there's a danger in that because their conscience will get seared and they won't be aware and you know what they'll drop off into hell your loved ones and mine because you know what they do they come here and they take this for granted amen so it's a danger in having your conscience seared preacher come 1 Corinthians 13 I'm going to be reading one verse, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I have become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. 
Now, I'll give you a little background. This message won't make a lot of sense until I explain it, but I got this message from all places from my science class. We were talking about the progression of computers and all that entails with that. We were talking about analog and digital data. We started talking about old television signals. Before digital television, you got your television by what we typically call two giant rabbit ears on your television. And if there was any noise on that signal, a clear picture would start to turn fuzzy and hazy. Something, something of that nature would cause it to do that. All because a noise was interrupting, interrupting the signal. Now with digital television, if you have a breezy day or noise coming across the digital signal, as long as it's in, within a certain threshold, it will, nothing will make the image not clear. It'll maintain its stability. For digital signals, there, be, there may be many hindrances, but you would never know. For analog signals, you know exactly when something's wrong. Many Christians today buy into the new technology. Some people have left knowing what's right for an ignorance is bliss mentality. They think if it doesn't affect me, it simply doesn't matter. As for analog Christians, they know exactly when they've done something wrong, but it's possible to tell when a digital signal has been hindered. But the only way to tell if it's been hindered is if it's been destroyed. In this situation, let's say for digital and analog Christians, noise is sin that is interrupting our fellowship and walk with the Lord. Digital Christians will allow sin up to a certain point because in their mind all sin isn't bad. And their tolerance for sin has broken them spiritually, and that has made them so spiritually blind they don't even know what's the problem. Wow. Analog Christians, on the other hand, have almost no tolerance for sin or noise. The second that something interrupts the signal between them and God, they figure out what the problem is and they get right. For your digital signal, when you're watching a movie on your TV and the internet cuts, what happens? You get stuck on a frame. You get stuck and you can't get out. You get stuck in one position and you can't move until that signal is restored. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Yeah. In with the old... Sorry, in with the old, now with the new. Just because you say all the right things, do all the right things, believe all the right things, doesn't mean that you're right. Because and the Bible says without charity, it means nothing, absolutely nothing. If you don't truly believe what you're saying, it means absolutely nothing. If you have a tolerance for sin, the love of the Father is not in you. Your words have become of none effect, Mark 7, 13. We're abandoning our duties and responsibilities in God's house, and we don't have that personal proper position with Christ. I would rather be cold and indifferent on God than to be lukewarm because then I've convinced myself that I'm right and nothing would change my opinion. It takes a lot more for a half-hearted Christian to get right than for a complete sinner to. After the northern kingdom of Israel fell, King Ahaz led the southern kingdom into idolatry. Ahaz was distressed and defeated by Syria. Judah was on the brink of calamity when God in his great mercy brought in Hezekiah, Ahaz's son, to the throne of Judah. And we usually read that kings walked wickedly in the sight of the Lord, but Hezekiah was an exception. He was the only exception at the end. The Bible says that he thoroughly smashed and destroyed the pagan idols, images, and shrines. He got rid of everything that was hindering his nation. He kept and promoted God's statutes, and because of this, he prospered. His country prospered. I'll end with this. I heard a story once about people hunting for a very rare type of monkey. They'd set up a trap for it. It would be a hollowed-out melon. they put something in the middle of it, and they put it way high up in a tree. They would leave and wait for the monkey to pass by. When the monkey would see it, he'd stick his hand in the hole, but he couldn't bring his hand back out because he grabbed onto the thing that had got his attention. He couldn't, he couldn't take his hand back out. After a couple hours, the hunters would come back and they would see the monkey totally freaking out and distressed. They would prime the rifle and they'd shoot it. Easy prey. Every single time. Just think of how easy it would have been for the monkey to let go. Just drop whatever it was holding on to and leave what had been hindering it. But he would not let go. He would not slip his hand out because he wanted it so bad. And because of that, it cost him his life. Christian friend, what are you holding on to? What is hindering you from having that close, restored relationship with God? What can you get rid of today that would ultimately be, ultimately be a blessing in your life? What noise is stopping you from hearing the hunter priming his rifle? What noise in the world? The world is just noise. What noise is hindering you from getting right with God? What, is keeping, what noise is keeping you from hearing him? You're drowning and you're holding on to an anchor. But you don't want to leave that anchor. But you have to because the hunter is rounding the corner and he's taking aim. Get your hand out before he chooses to take a shot. Now I'm with this. Friend, what are you holding on to? I'm done. Proverbs chapter number 19. 
can read verse number 11. The Bible says, The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. Now, I wish we had time to define a couple of things in this verse, but the first one is deferreth. Right? It means to defer. Two definitions. One means to put off for another time. Well, that one don't apply in this verse, because read the second half of the verse. It's his glory to pass over a transgression. How many times did God pass over Israel? Once. After he did it, he didn't look back. If you pass over something, you left it. You're not coming back to it. So defer doesn't mean that we'll come back to it later. It says that he deferreth his anger, meaning that he yields to somebody else's authority. Deference is the word that we would often use to be reverent towards another. Well, this man, or any man, verse number 11, the discretion of a man deferreth his anger. Or in other words, says, I don't have the right to be angry. Somebody else has a better right to be angry. So I'm going to put my anger on the shelf and instead embrace something besides anger. Right? That choice is called discretion. Discretion, if we were to define it out, would be to choose what applies and what is irrelevant. The man in this verse says, it's irrelevant how I feel. What's more important is to forgive the person in the second half of the verse. Discretion is your ability to say, I feel this way, I think this way, I know this to be right, we could do this, we could do that, and it's the mechanism that you use to make a choice. Wow. We know about discernment, fewer people know about discretion. Discretion is choosing what it is that you're going to do. Well, how do you do that? You choose what's important and what applies and what's irrelevant. This man had enough humility to realize that even though he had been transgressed against, it was more important to restore or to forgive than for him to take out his anger on somebody. Let me give you an example. Let's say you own a business and somebody who you told to write a check for 20 wrote a check for 200. That's a transgression. They made a mistake. You can either be angry or you can defer your anger and say, instead of getting angry about it, how about we make sure it doesn't happen again? It's his glory, it says. It's the greatest thing that he can do to pass over a trench. Instead of judging someone, committing his anger into action, it's better for him, the best thing that he can do is to better somebody instead of destroy him. Why did he do it? Because of discretion. You've heard me say before, far too many Christians don't have discernment, fewer have discretion. You know why some people get up and come to church, Brother Josh? Because they, in their discretion, choose it's important. You know why some people, Brother Ron, understand that there are people out there that have their conscience seared with eyes, and they're going to go after them and break through the gates of hell to do all that they can to bring those people out. You know why? They, because in their discretion, they value those people. You know when a lost person stops being a lost person and they become a soul? When in your discretion, you pass over their sin, you defer judgment to God, because Christ said that all judgment has been committed unto Him. You look past what they've done and you see who they are. You know how you do that? Discretion. You want to know why you either do or don't do things for the Lord? Because your discretion has judged either it is important or it has no value. You want to know why some people make a difference for the Lord? Because in their discretion, they've judged that the only thing that matters is what they do for the Lord. They'd give up home and house and every meal that they've ever had just to go out and know that they're in the perfect will of God. You know how that happened? Discretion. What is discretion? Discretion is that voice inside of your head that you argue with all the time. And it's the end of the argument where you decide what you're going to do. God built you. God birthed you with a measure of faith, but He also gave you choice. Discretion is you exercising that choice. It can be right or wrong. But the choice is yours. Nobody makes you do anything. Nobody makes me do anything. 
We do it because of our discretion. And some people, their discretion is that it doesn't matter how many revival meetings, doesn't matter how many times a preacher preaches on something, they've, in their discretion, decided that's not valuable to them. That's why revival hadn't come. That's why America's in a mess. That's why the world is on its way to hell in a handbasket. Because people's discretion judge some things as invaluable, and they've rejected what God said was supposed to be valuable. But that's it. Uh, Genesis 41. First seven verses. We've all heard this before, but I read it and I had never seen this before in there. Starting out like this, and it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh, Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood, he stood by the river. And behold, there came up out of the uh, river seven well favored kin and fat fleshed, and they fed in a meadow. Verse 3 And behold, seven other kin came up after them out of the river, ill favored, lean fleshed, and stood by the other kin upon the brink of the river. Verse 4, and the ill-favored and lean flesh can did eat up the seven well-favored fat can. So Pharaoh awoke. This is number two. This is the second dream. Now this is going to go somewhere. And he slept and dreamed the second time. And behold, seven ears of corn came up after one stalk and rank and good. Verse 6, and behold, seven thin ears and blasted with an east wind sprung up after them. And number seven, and seven thin ears devoured the seventh rank and full ears, and Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Now here's from verse three to verse seven, five times, five is the number of grace, which is, and seven times means completion. Now we go to verse 12, and there was, of this chapter, and there was there with us a young man, a Hebrew servant, to the captain of the guard, and he told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. That's what Joseph did. Right. To each man according to his dream, and he did interpret it. Now, if we go all the way over, I'm cutting a lot of this out of here. Now, between um, 25 and 28, then we go to 32. Now, and Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God has, showed, God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. It's no different from what God's shown us what he's going to do here. I said, good night in the morning. Because it's reputation. We come to church, it's reputation. We hear from our pastor. We hear from uh, what's going to be taking place. And then we pass out tracts. That's reputation. We have to get reputation in order to get it in our mindset. We have to go out there. That's our field out there. That's our mission field. We tell people what to do. Then we come back in here and get our information. That's why Pharaoh had to dream twice. It's reputation. He knew what to do because in verse 8, it talks about conviction. It convicted him so much, someone's got to interpret this for me. But now we go by faith and hope. That's what we go by nowadays. But now... God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. Joseph tells Pharaoh the purpose. God is showing Pharaoh the future, and it is viewed in the events will shortly come. Like Brother Josh said, when, are we going to get up there when we're at, uh, with God if you're not a Christian? God's, if you're a Christian this day, you're going to have victory. You're, you've already got the victory. In order to get the victory, you've got to study these 66 books. That's how it's going to take place. You've got to put forth an effort in order to get what's going on. Pharaoh got it. He dreamed the dreams. It was reputation. But now in verse 32, Joseph informed Pharaoh of the dream. It was doubled. Two events. It was, this was a twofold event. Certainly of the event, it was established by God. God does not repeat because he's senile or forgetful. He's getting our attention. He re and also he repeats to emphasize certainly of the events. God will bring it to pass just like he's brought everything else to pass. It's going to happen. Rest assured. Christian friend, don't get too comfortable here. Praise the Lamb of God. I'm done. Psalm 90 and verse 2. The Bible says, Before the mountains were brought forth, wherever thou 
has formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Yeah. But you don't understand about what that phrase means. Everlasting to everlasting is this. It's as far into the future as you can go right. to infinity. But it's also as far in the past as you can go right. to infinity. Right. All right, from everlasting to everlasting, God is God. Yeah. You have that point? Yeah. All right, now listen. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16, the Bible says this, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. And this everlasting to everlasting God is love. There has never been a time when God has not been love, and there will never be a time when God is not love. God is love from everlasting to everlasting. He does not just love, he is love. Right? Number three, Jeremiah 31 3 says this The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Now, most of the time when we look at that verse, we look into the future. I, God's loved me with an everlasting love, He's never going to stop loving me. But if he's the God from everlasting to everlasting, that tells me that there's never been a time in the past when he did not love me. Right. From everlasting to everlasting, he's God. Amen. And in his everlasting state, he is love, and he's loved me, and he has loved you. We, we, we think about that truth. It's always for the future. But understand, he's always loved you. Right. Knowing exactly who you are and what you've done or what you would do. Right. Yeah. He's always loved you. And so when we read John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, what did He do? Well, we celebrate. Today is that day. Right. We celebrate that he's, He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Right. God proved this love for us by sending Jesus to be our Savior. But listen to this. In 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 18 through 20, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Since God has loved us with an everlasting love, His love decided upon our need of a Savior even before we were created. And God has carried out His plan. He is a, a, a God that has loved us even before there was a beginning of anything else. Before Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, God already loved you. Amen. And He's always loved you. And He will always love you. I wonder how sad He is when we don't love Him back. But He has always loved us. He has an everlasting love. And His love decided upon our need of a Savior even before we were ever created. This is an everlasting love. What, what a great love that is. Uh, what a great Savior. From everlasting to everlasting, He's loved you and me, and He's proven this love to us over and over and over again. On this wonderful day when we celebrate the risen Savior, I ask this simple question. How have you responded to His love for you? Have you trusted Him as your Savior? Do you love Him back? Do you live for Him as your Lord? Do you love Him with all your heart? He has always loved you. And He will always love you. What a wonderful love that is. Do you love Him? Do you love Him back? He's always loved you. On a day like today, 
I just think it's a little easier, maybe, to love him. But it ought to be that way every day. Because knowing, and I'll just speak for me, knowing who I am, and him knowing everything I would do, he still loved me. And still sent Jesus into the world for me. And still made it possible that I could be a part of his family. An everlasting family with everlasting life and everlasting love. Now, I get to enjoy that everlasting love because I trusted Christ. But there are those who God has loved from the beginning that one day will not be able to experience that at all. But He'll still love them. But they'll be in hell. How are you responding? to the love he has for us. Psalms 124 verse number 7. The Bible says our soul escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Praise the Lord that the Lord loved us and when we were caught in a trap, when we were in the bullseye, and we were clutching things that held us trapped, the Lord came by and set us free. Huh? Our soul is escaped tonight. If you're born again, you've escaped the power of sin and the bondage of sin. You've escaped Satan's clutches. Uh, you're no longer in the snare of the fowlers. Uh, the snare's been broken by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and hallelujah, we are escaped. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, uh, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, we couldn't get out of the snare under our own accord. Uh, there was no hope in our own selves, uh, but the Lord came by and broke the snare uh, and made a way where you and I could be set free. Uh, I'm glad I'm no longer bound to my sin. I'm glad I'm no longer in bondage, uh, but I've been set free by the darling Son of God. Uh, as I was reading this, I got to thinking about the snares of the devil. Can I say the devil uses snares... Uh, to blind the lost. Lost people are lost because they don't see what eternity has for them. The devil's been real crafty about blinding the minds of them lest the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ should shine unto them. If people got one glimpse of hell, they'd all get saved. If people got one glimpse uh, of what God has in store for them that love them, they'd all get saved. Uh, if people really got a glimpse, uh, they could be set free from the bondage of their sin, they'd get set, set free. But you see, it's kind of like the old adage. The devil put a billboard of sin out there, and there is pleasure in sin for a season. And they look at that like having a good time, but the devil knows it never shows them the backside of the, of the billboard, never shows them the cost of sin, never shows them what sin will do to them. The devil uses the snares of blindness on the lost. He uses snares of beliefs on the religious. The people don't get saved uh, out of religion when they base everything on what religion has taught them. Well, I believe this. If I had a dollar for every time I've, I've tried to help somebody and, and all I hear in return is, well, I'm a Catholic. Like that's some special right to heaven. And most of them couldn't tell you what Catholics believe. I've even asked them, well, what's the name of the priest? Uh, 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 they hadn't been to the Catholic Mass in, in decades. But they're holding on to their religious beliefs. The devil uses that. He uses, well, I, I was hurt in church, or I believe everybody eventually is going to make their way to heaven, or I believe this and I believe that, and de the devil uses the snare of belief 
on those that are religious. But then he uses the snares of barriers on the saved. Now that verse tells us that we have escaped the snare of the fowlers, the snare's broken, and we are escaped. But the devil wants to put us in snares. And he uses barriers on the saved. And so I want to give you just what time I have left. You say, how long are you going to preach till I get done? But I want to give you just three little simple barriers of the devil on the saved. Now you've been set free if you've been saved. Why are you in bondage tonight? What's holding you back tonight? Why don't you love the Lord like you should tonight? Why don't you use certain discretion that a saved person should use tonight? Why are you offering up excuses before the Lord tonight? Why are you even as a saved person letting a, letting a sorry no good snake of a devil sear your conscience to believe that you're okay? You don't need revival. Hmm? Why does the Lord have to appear to us from a message uh, 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 time and time again from the Scriptures to remind us that we need to draw closer to Him? I mean, I preached on uh, fleeing the Lord on Wednesday, and Brother Josh, first message out, he had to preach that we're still fleeing the Lord. Why is that? Why does the Lord, through repeti repetition, have to remind us over and over and over and over? Shouldn't He speak one time and that be enough? And how come... Uh, we're too plugged in being digital Christians instead of analog Christians. We don't even see things have gotten fuzzy. I was telling my wife on the way here tonight, there are some people in their politics, they are so conservative, they will not bend. They are right-wing of right-wing fundamental conservatives. But in their religion, they've gotten liberal. They'll spit on the thought of liberalism in their politics. But it's okay to have a rock band in the church. It's okay to have fog machines in the church. It's okay to do without the pulpit in the church. It's okay to no longer have preaching in the church. We can just let up a little bit in church, but not in our politics. Because they don't recognize what's gotten fuzzy. What are the barriers that the devil uses to ensnare saved people? Can I say the first barrier he uses is familiarity. Familiarity breeds contentment. We get so used to being saved and going through the motions, we just have gotten good at it. Huh? Some of you sit in the same seat week after week after week after week. You say, well, I'm used to this seat. Yeah. You know who knows you're going to be sitting there? The devil. Because right. you never do anything to confuse him because you're content. You're content on where you are spiritually. We ought to never become satisfied where we are until we've bumped into Jesus. When was the last time you bumped into him? The Bible says, draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. When did you stop resisting? Because that's when he ensnared you. We're so familiar. You know why we're having revival meetings? Do you know why I have three powerhouse preachers coming in here, especially Cody and, and Travis? I mean, these guys will shuck the corn. You know why I'm having them? Not because we've fallen in love with Brother Cody and we've just gotten to know Brother Travis. Hmm? Because you've gotten used to hearing my voice. You've gotten used to my mannerisms. It amazes me Miss Cinda, when I close my Bible, everybody closes their Bible. Like the message is over. Hmm? You've gotten used 
to some of the phraseology that I use. Now what will amaze me is I'll be sitting here next week and these fellows will say some of the exact same things that I say, but some of you are going to shout and you haven't shouted in seven months. It's going to be like a new revelation to you. You know why? Because you've gotten used to my voice. You've gotten familiar. Do uh, you ever wonder why I get asked to go preach so many meetings and yet some of you here don't hear the preaching anymore? Because where I get to go, they've gotten used to their pastor's voice. Hmm? Familiarity is a barrier the devil uses. Now, I can't ever find you anymore, but I'm glad you moved. If nothing else, you've confused the pastor, but you probably confused the devil. Uh, you know what? It's hard to hit a moving target. So quit sitting down on the Lord and keep moving. But familiarity is a barrier the devil uses to ensnare people. See, by coming to church all the time, by sitting where you're sitting, by singing the same songs, uh, by getting used to the pastor's voice, we become content. Amen. I was talking to my brother-in-law today, and, I, and, and he did not understand or hadn't heard that uh, today uh, our uh, illustrious and all-together and all-with-it president proclaimed today Transgender Visibility Day. And they can say that it's been a holiday for 10 years, liar, liar, pants on fire. Uh, but he hadn't heard that. And he said, well, when are Christians going to stand up against all this stuff? I'm thinking, well, I do every week. I'm surprised I haven't been stoned yet. But I answered him. I said, well, where's our voice going to get heard? We have no media outlet. I mean, the media talks about us like we're uh, uh, the criminals. We have no figurative head that'll stand up. But you know what the Bible says? We're not to be strikers and brawlers. We're to proclaim truth. You know where we'll stand up? On the job, at the school, uh, in our neighborhoods, by telling folks, by passing out tracts, uh, by letting folks know they can be born again. They don't have to be caught up in all this mess. Mm. By the way, I believe seven of the last mass shootings have all been committed by people who have identified as being non-binary or transgender. The media don't bring that out. You know why? Because these people are full of the devil. Let me say that again. This trans crowd is full of the devil. You said, prove it to me, preach, I will. Uh, uh, go read 1 Kings chapter number 18. Read your Bible uh, anytime. Read uh, 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 where folks uh, in 1 Kings 18, they cut themselves. Uh, read over there the Gospels when they brought uh, uh, the child to the Lord Jesus. They called him a lunatic, uh, full of the devil, because uh, he'd oftentimes throw himself into a fire. Uh, 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 can I say people that are possessed with the devil constantly want to inflict punishment on themselves. Uh, hey, uh, anybody uh, with any humanity about themselves, uh, we have something instilled in us uh, where we love ourselves. We don't want to hurt ourselves. Uh, we want uh, good things to happen to ourselves. Uh, what happens? It causes people uh, uh, to hurt themselves uh, and want to hurt others. They're full of the devil, my dear friends. Uh, and when people want to mutilate their bodies to become something and they're not, they're full of the devil. That didn't cost you anywhere. It's nowhere in my notes. But I'm saying we've getting, gotten so familiar with the preacher getting up and preaching on mashed potato brains Biden. And all the, there's still going to be people in our church that aren't even registered to vote, won't even vote this year. Uh, shame on you. You ought to love America enough to absolutely uh, 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 take part in the privileges that are afforded you being an American. Quit complaining about the border crossings if you won't vote. 
But quit complaining about what's going on in America if you don't pray, uh, if you don't seek the Lord, uh, and if you don't uh, uh, shine your light into this dark world. huh? God help us. We've gotten so familiar with everything going on, it don't bother us anymore. Does anybody know the first show that showed a homosexual on it? I didn't think so. It was a sitcom called Soap. And the first uh, so-called identified homosexual on American television was Billy Crystal in that show. And because he was funny and because uh, uh, he was cute in his little tennis gym shorts that he wore around, everybody just said, oh, that's not too bad. So now you can't watch a commercial without it showing two women in it in the same household or two men in it. And some commercials show men kissing men and women kissing. That is absolutely sick and grotesque. But we got so familiar with it. You see, you give the devil an inch, he takes more than an inch. We've gotten so familiar with it that now that it bothers us so bad, we can't turn the tide. And can I say we've gotten so familiar not having the fire of God in our churches that it's going to take more than just a week of meetings Amen. to have true revival. The devil uses familiarity to ensnare God's people. He also uses faithlessness. When was the last time you really had to live by faith as a child of God? Amen. I didn't think so. Are we complaining? Complain about the price of gas. Miss Annette told me the other day, four years ago, gas, gas was a dollar nineteen or something. Now it's three twenty nine or something. We complain about it. We don't like it. But we still pull up and put the pump in. And we don't have to pray, God, you've got to give me the money or I'm not going to be able to have gas in my car to get to work. We don't know anything about living by faith. We don't even sing the hymn anymore. Huh? We don't live by faith. I remember a time... Miss Annette and I, we had to pray food on our table. We don't do that. Now we get bored with the choices we have. Hmm? Huh? The devil has ensnared us with faithlessness. Christians don't walk by faith. We don't live by faith. What we do is we, are, we become mechanical. Amen. We become logical. We make choices based on logic, not choices based on the Word of God. Because we don't have to live by faith. Hmm? My dear friends, if we don't let the Lord break that snare, there may be a day when we're going to have to live by faith. And trust me, most Christians will fail the test. Hmm? Now, I know you don't believe this. I did grow up in the country. I did grow up eating fried bologna and Spam. Anybody remember Spam? The other meat? I grew up eating that stuff. Huh? I remember a big delicacy was peanut butter and honey, man. That was big time, huh? Uh, I know what black-eyed peas are. Pinto beans and cornbread. I know when pinto beans and cornbread just wasn't a choice. That was all you had. Huh? And my grandma didn't make that sweet jiffy mix cornbread. We had that old crack corn that come out of that cast iron still, skillet, that, that, that uh, uh, white cornbread. Huh? You had to have pinto beans or milk to dip it in, or you wasn't getting that stuff down. It'd choke you to death. It was dry as cracker juice. Huh? But you was glad to get it. Uh, I remember if you didn't grow it in the garden, you didn't eat. Mm -mm. I said all that because we don't know anything about that today. Mm -mm. Uh, 
What happens if the real chain supply is cut off and the grocery stores don't have food anymore? I tell you what's going to happen to most crowd in here tonight. You're going to die. Amen. Now, I know he can hunt for food. He's been doing it all his life. I don't know that Eddie can, but Clint can. <laughs> Eddie, when's the last time you went hunting? Yeah, that's what I thought. Huh? <laughs> well, think about it. I grew up rabbit hunting. Dude, I don't even know which way, which end of the gun to point anymore, huh? Just think about it. If you got to hunt it, Brother Tony, and then you got to skin it, huh? I remember rabbits being in the pot in the refrigerator. Some of you throw up today. <laughs> yeah. A skinned rabbit being in the pot, huh? You got to skin it, then you got to cook it, then you got to eat it. Wild taste and all, huh? Tommy's getting sick over there. You got a gallbladder problem or you just don't like food? Huh? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> See, we don't know anything about that. Two generations ago, that was how you lived. Huh? Grocery stores clam up. We're all going to Jim and Judy's house. You ain't going to like what you have to shoot to eat. Huh? Did you ever eat something and you had buckshot in it? Yeah? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> what did you say the other day? Lord have mercy. <laughs> Somebody get a bottle of oil. We're going to pray over this boy right here. He got lead poisoning right now. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Clint. That helped my illustration I didn't know I was going to give. Huh? What I'm saying is, we don't know how to live like that. We don't, have to, we don't know how to live by faith. We don't know how to live praying in stuff. We certainly don't know how to live in this society trusting in God. Now, if you need money, you just put it on a credit card or you go see the banker. Used to, people had to trust God. Anybody remember S&H Green Stamps? That was as close to credit as there was back in the day. Huh? You had to fill your tank up with gas 67 times to get a stick of gum. Huh? Huh? Tea garden gum. Anybody remember that? Yeah. See, y'all start to figure out how old I am. Huh? Well, I'm trying to say, we don't live by faith anymore. And we've gotten so used to living by faith, when preachers preach on it, it bounces off of us like a rubber ball against a brick wall. But the devil's used that because he knows that the Lord said, without faith it's impossible to please God. Right. Brother Adrian preached on when's the last time you loved the Lord back. You know how you love the Lord back? You prove your love to him by walking by faith, believing what God said. Amen. We don't do that. Because it's not convenient. Because we become digital Christians. We don't know there's a problem. And the real problem is we won't know there's a problem till it's too late. Right. And the problem is overtaking us. Yeah. Preached a message years ago, and you won't miss the water till the well runs dry. The devil's used faithlessness. He's used familiarity. But the final barrier that he's used is franchise, franchisement. Franchisement. That's hard for a hillbilly to say. You say, what does that mean? We think we have immunity. We think we're the exception to the rule. That the Bible applies to others, but not us. Our conscience is seared. We think we have exemption. The Lord don't really expect me to live like the Bible says to live. I can choose how I want to live, and God will still be pleased because He does love me. He does love you. But He also said, Be ye holy, for I'm holy. Huh? Can I say we've uh, uh, got this ideal that we're our own franchisement, that we're immune to uh, 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 all that the Bible really says and all that God really says. I mean, did God really mean for us to not forsake ourselves together? 
We'll justify our, our own feelings uh, that Brother Jordan preached on and our own uh, 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 opinions. We'll justify it because we love self so much uh, that we have not truly sought to do what God says. The devil has caused us to feel like we're our own island, that we're immune to these things because he's caused us to become self-reliant. We're self-reliant because we really, truly don't need the Lord. Seriously. When was the last time you really needed the Lord? I mean, really needed Him. Hmm? Now, I appreciate Miss Crystal. She's in a situation right now. She really needs the Lord. And... I know that she knows that she really needs the Lord. When was the last time you was in that shape? That you really needed Him. Hmm? Brittany sings that song where we say, Lord, I, I really need you and I need you now. But he was four days late. But he was still right on time. But when was the last time you really was desperate before the Lord and you needed Him? Even when we really should need Him, the devil has convinced us by searing our consciences, Brother Ron, to where we've learned to trust in ourselves. We've become self-reliant. We've learned how to move things and readjust things and depend on things based on our decisions, not on... God hearing and answering prayer. We become self-reliant. We become self-regulating. We choose what part of the Bible we want to trust and what part we don't. Amen. Hmm? It amazes me what kind of things people will come up with to twist the Bible. Hmm? Amazes me. Tithing was an Old Testament doctrine. Then why did Jesus do it? Why did the Apostle Paul do it and commend to do it? Hmm? Tithing really don't mean money. Me giving my time to church is my tithe. Me giving my talent is my tithe. You're making God puke right about now when you're saying stuff like that. Go read uh, Revelation chapter 3. You're beyond lukewarm. He's spewing you out of his mouth. But you're self-regulating. Well, attendance is based on how I feel. Well, I think uh, that was all we already addressed tonight. Hmm? Huh? It's based on how you feel. Why are some of you here tonight? Why are you here in that wheelchair? I mean... You have a right. You're in a wheelchair. God don't expect you to come to church in a wheelchair. But see, they don't understand. You didn't have to come. You got to come. Because it wasn't that long ago, you longed to come and couldn't get here. And you'd come by any means necessary, even riding in that little Ford that she bought. Huh? Right? Huh? When are you going to let her crank up that big hog and bring you in on that bike? Huh? Uh, let's see, we're self-regulating. We choose. And the devil's ensnared you. You have no touch of God in your life. You have no power from God. You have no victory. You have no joy. You know what you are tonight? You're sitting on a church pew numb. Because you've been set free, but you are re-snared tonight. Oh, you're going to heaven. You're just not enjoying the trip. He uses franchisement to make us feel self-righteous. You know why you won't pass out a track, invite somebody to church, tell somebody about the Lord? You think you're too good for that. Amen. We become self-righteous. We've come to where we think we know it all and that we, we are it and everybody else is beneath us. Hmm? 
We'll pound the pulpit. and We'll pound our chest. And we are not Calvinists, but yet we're practicing Calvinists because we never tell anybody about the Lord. We just think they're going to eventually end up in heaven. Amen. We become self-righteous. We say this and I'll be done. How sad to be liberated from sin only to become bound by the devil once again. You know why we need revival? Because we've jumped back in the snare and we've closed the door. The devil has no power to close us in. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God. We've allowed him to. We've let him lull us to sleep. We've went and laid down in the snare and closed the door and turned off the lights. Paul warned of this in Galatians 5.1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Can I say that word, be not entangled again, gives us the power. We have the victory of freedom, or we can be entangled again. It's all our choice. Why would you want to be ensnared? when you've been set free. God help us to live in the victory we have in Christ. We serve a risen Savior. We've been raised in newness of life. Why should we let that life filter through us and us being truly the salt and the light the Lord wants us to be? Too many of God's people have allowed themselves to be ensnared and they're not having victory tonight. Been enough preaching tonight to cause us to hunger for more of Christ and less of us. To hunger for revival. To hunger to see a move of God. The real quest is, will we? Will we see revival? Will we hunger for God? Will we love God back? Will we not allow our consciences to be seared, but our hearts to be dealt with? Will we truly recognize whether or not we're digital or analog? And if we're analog, a little fuzzy. Will we not flee from Jesus, but flee to Jesus? Will we let God speak this one time and us act on it rather than repetition, repetition, repetition. Repetition is a great way to learn, but it wears God out. He is long-suffering towards us, but He'd rather us get it the first time. Amen. I wonder tonight, will you let God have your way? Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. Why would you want to be ensnared again? So they're picking a song. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our preachers minding the Lord. Thank you for how the messages flowed together. And thank you, Lord, for wanting to help us tonight. Lord, you have blessed us so much that, Lord, we've gotten spoiled. We're almost to the point where we look at you like that church of Laodicea and saying we're increased with goods and have need of nothing. And we know not how poor, wretched, miserable, and blind, and naked we really are. God, help us tonight to seek your face. Help us to love you back. Help us to long for the presence of God and the power of God once again in our lives. God, we realize what's going on in the world, but Lord, we won't uh, a lot of times let you do inventory in our hearts so we realize what's going on in our own life. So God, help us, Lord, to be all we can be for Christ. Bless down this invitation. Speak to hearts. Have your will and way. God, to help folks to just mind the Lord, we'll bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.